the Chicago Theater of the Air. Produced and narrated by Marion Clare, conducted by Henry Weber, written and directed by Jack LaFrandre, Mutual presents radio's greatest hour of music and drama, the famous Chicago Theater of the Air. Tonight's performance, The Mikado by Gilbert and Sullivan, starring Norma Lotze, David Polari, and John Barkley, supported by Ruth Slater, Flora Patterson, and Bruce Foote, with an all-Chicago dramatic cast headed by Muriel Bremner, Everett Clark, and Carl Crunky. Featured speaker of the evening is Colonel Robert R. McCormick, distinguished editor and publisher of the Chicago Tribune, who will be heard between acts of this production. The Chicago Theater of the Air presents The Mikado. <laughs> pagodas rise before us as we visit the mythical Japanese town of Titipu. In the background is the palace of Koko, Lord High Executioner. In the foreground, a forlorn individual named Nanki Pu is asking the identity of a group of gentlemen gathered outside the palace of Koko. These gentlemen are only too happy to introduce themselves. <laughs> If you want to know who we are, we are gentlemen of Japan. On many a bus and job, on many a screen and fire. We figure in lively paint, our hands can swear and wait. You're wrong if you think it ain't. Gentlemen, gentlemen, I pray you, I beg audience with one of your number. Two more. Observe who begs audience. A singular young man with guitar on his back and ballads in his hands. Mm, most singular. And very unwashed. Speak up, sir. What is your business? I pray you, good sir. I search for the dwelling of a gentle maiden named Yum Yum. She is a ward of Coco. Uh, quite fortuitously, you have arrived at the very house. But who are you to presume to ask for the gentle yum yum? A wandering minstrel, I a thing of shreds and patches, of ballad songs and snatches, and dreamy lullaby. My cat alone is Thank you. 
charm your willing ears with songs of lovers' tears. While sympathetic tears my cheeks bid you. Patriotic sentiment is wanted. I patriotic ballads cut and dry. For whatever our country's banners may be planted, all other local banners are defied. Our warriors and serried ranks assemble. Never quail are they conceal it if they do. And I shouldn't be surprised if nations tremble before the mighty trust the groups of pity poor. And if you call for the song of the sea, will he the captain run? The yo he call for the wind is free, her to the trip and the helm's on the for the homeward bound. To lay a lot in a hall in the reef, may tickle a landsman's taste. But the happiest town a sailor sees is when he's down a midland town with his Nancy on his knees. Yo ho! And his arm around her waist. Lay a lot in a hearty feast, they sing a lot of Lansman's taste. But the happiest town a sailor sees is when he's down a midland town with his Nancy on his knees. Yo ho! And his arm around her waist. Wandering minstrel, dear, dear me, such a lowly station. Now, what business could you possibly have with Yum Yum? May I ask who you are to presume upon my presumption? Mm, quite astounding that you should be so uninformed. I beg to inform you, sir, that yonder is the palace of the Lord High Executioner. But I, Pooh Bah, am Lord High Everything Else. Lord High Everything Else? Pooh Bah, my apologies. This puts a different light on the matter. Proceed with your explanation, if you please. I demand to be illuminated. My name is Mankey Poo. A year ago, I was second trombone of the Titty Poo Town Band. Second trombone? <laughs> a horrible instrument. It was then that I saw Yum Yum and fell at once in love with her. A very romantic story. <sighs> then I found out that she was already betrothed to a guardian, Coco, a cheap tailor. Oh, a heartbreaking recital. But. Judge of my delight when I heard a month ago that Coco has been condemned to death for flirting and that Yum Yum is now free to marry me. Oh, how sad. How very, very sad. Sad? My dear second trombone, it becomes my painful duty to inform you that at the last moment Coco was reprieved and raised by our great Mikado to the exalted rank of Lord High Executioner. Coco is the Lord High Executioner? But... But what of Yum Yum? Ah, uh, hopeless case. In point of fact, this very afternoon, she's to marry Coco. Ah, me. Sad is my loss, indeed. Behold, observe, the mighty Coco even now arrives in the courtyard. He is followed by the fawning populace. Excuse me while I fawn. Behold the Lord, the executioner. A
taken from a county jail by a set of curious chances, liberated then on bail, on me on recognizances, wafted by a favoring gale, as one sometimes is in trances, to a height that few can scale, save by long and weary dances, surely never had a male, under such like circumstances, so adventurous a tale, which may rank with most romances, taken from a county jail, by a set of curious chances, surely never had a male, so adventurous a tale. My reception does you credit. Uh, Coco, Your Excellency, how are things in Coco Mungo? Uh, excellent, excellent indeed. Poobah, it seems that the festivities in connection with my marriage to Yum Yum must last a week. I should like to do it handsomely, and I'd like to consult you as to the amount I ought to spend. Uh, certainly. In which of my capacities? As First Lord of the Treasury, Lord Chamberlain, Attorney General, Chancellor of the Exchequer, Privy Purse, or Private Secretary? Suppose we say as private secretary. In such capacity, I should say that as the city has to pay for it, don't stint yourself. Do it well. Exactly, as the city will have to pay for it. That's your advice? As private secretary. Of course, you understand that as chancellor of the exchequer, I am bound to see that due economy is observed. But, but you said don't stint yourself, do it well. As private secretary. And now you say the due economy must be observed. As chancellor of the exchequer. I see. Let's speak so the Chancellor can't hear us. Yes, 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 yes. And now, as my solicitor, how do you advise me to deal with this difficulty? As your solicitor, I have no hesitancy in saying, chance it. Thank you. Let me shake your hand. But alas, as Lord Hot Chief Justice, I am bound to see that the law is not violated. Well, I see. Let's speak so the Lord Chief Justice can't hear us. Oh, yes, yes, yes. yes. And now then. As First Lord of the Treasury, what do you propose? As First Lord of the Treasury, I could propose a special vote that would cover all expenses. But, as leader of the opposition, it would be my duty to resist it, tooth and nail. Oh. Of course, as Paymaster General, I could juggle the account so that, as Lord High Auditor, I should never discover the fraud. But then, as Archbishop of Titipu, it would be my solemn duty to denounce my dishonesty and give myself into my own custody as First Commissioner of Police. How awkward. How extremely awkward. I, I don't say that all my distinguished officers couldn't be square. Part of it is only right to inform you that they wouldn't be sufficiently degraded in their own estimation unless they are insulted with uh, <clears throat> a considerable bribe. Hmm. Cash? Cash. Or a reasonable facsimile. Oh, 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 my bride and her sister's approach. Hoover, oh, any little compliment on your part, such as an abject grovel in characteristic Japanese attitude, would be a scene to favor.
That is to be the little yum yum. Hmm? Oh, wait, Coco. You're not going to kiss me before all these people. Well, that was the general idea. Yum yum. At last I found you. Nanky Poo, it's really Nanky Poo. Wait, aren't you going to introduce me? Oh, oh, Coco. Um, uh, this is the musician who used to. Um, you, uh, he's my second trombone. He's your what, sir? I have the misfortune to love your ward, Yum Yum. Eh? Oh, I know I deserve your anger. Anger? Not a bit, my boy. Why, I love her myself. Charming little thing, isn't she? <laughs> uh, very glad to hear my opinion backed up by a competent authority. Pishtosh, take him away. Wait, Your Excellency. I bear a letter from His Majesty, the Mikado. <laughs> a letter from the Mikado? It arrived this very moment. Dear me, dear, dear me. What is it, Your Excellency? Oh, the Mikado is struck by the fact that no executions have taken place in Titipu for a whole year. He decrees that unless someone is beheaded within one month, the post of Lord High Executioner shall be abolished. What's this? What of my post of Lord High everything else? That too? Oh. The wedding is postponed for the time being. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Come, Puba, We must talk this over. <laughs> Ah, yum, yum. At last we are alone. Oh, be careful, Nanky Poo. The laws against flirting are extremely severe. Deuce take the law. If it were not for the law, we should now be sitting side by side like this. <sighs> we should both be gazing into each other's eyes like this. <sighs> Breathing sighs of unutterable love like this. Oh. With our arms around each other, we put our lips close together, and then... Yes, thank you, Paul. Oh, if it wasn't for the law, and I wasn't engaged to Coco. Oh, me, engaged to Coco. Oh, oh whoa. Were you not to Coco plighted, I would say in tender tone, loved one less. Sneers are not to us, and to mark my admiration, I would fondly kiss you thus. I would kiss you fondly thus. But since I'm engaged to Coco, to embrace you thus, and Coco, would you think to be no Coco? And for that, I should get Coco. Togo, Togo, So in spite of all temptation, such a thing I must And on no consideration will I kiss you for only thus. Will I kiss you? Let me make it clear to you, this is what I'll never do. This or this, or this, or this, this is what I'll never, never do. This or this, or this, or this, this is what I'll never do. He'll never do. I'll never do. He'll never do. Oh, this, this is what I'll never, never Just a moment. Nanky-poo. Nanky-poo. Oh, 
What are your intentions with that rope? I am about to terminate an unbearable existence. Oh, salvation. Happy salvation. I beg your pardon. Thank you, Pooh. You're absolutely certain that you're resolved to die. Absolutely. Oh, then by all means, don't spoil your reputation by committing suicide. I will arrange to have you beheaded handsomely to buy the public executioner. I don't see how that would benefit me. Oh, come now, observe. A month to live like a fighting cock at my expense. Then a great procession, band playing, bells tolling, all the girls in tears. Yum, yum, sorely distracted. All right, I'll do it on one condition. Allow me to marry yum, yum tomorrow, and in a month you may behead me. Thank you, Pooh. While I adore the gentle yum yum with the tenderest passion, I find that I adore myself with passion tenderer still. Take her. She's yours. For he's going to marry yum yum. Yum yum. You rang your friend Barry for more will be Barry. I think you had better succumb. Come, come. And join our expression. Stay on the subject that way you'll be dumb. Dum dum. You'll find there are many who went for a pity. The word for your guidance is mum. Mum mum. There's lots of good vision to see. On the subject that way you'll be dumb. Dum dum. You think you had better succumb. Our Chicago Theater of the Air production of The Mikado by Gilbert and Sullivan will continue following a featured radio commentary by Colonel Robert R. McCormick, editor and publisher of the Chicago Tribune, outspoken American patriot, noted world historian. The subject of this evening's commentary, Triumph at Yorktown. Ladies and gentlemen, Colonel Robert R. McCormick. train imaginable. General Washington recalled the campaign of 1781. The difficulty consisted more in providing than knowing how to apply the military apparatus. Before the arrival of Count de Grasse, it was the fixed determination to strike the enemy in the most vulnerable quarter. The point of attack was not absolutely agreed upon because it could not be foreknown where the enemy would be most susceptible. New York was thought to be beyond our effort. Consequently, the only hesitation that remained was between an attack upon the British Army in Virginia or that in Charleston. After the arrival of the Count de Grasse, <clears throat> the hostile post in Virginia became the definite and certain object of the campaign. The hostile point in Virginia was, of course, Lord Cornwallis fortified beachhead on the York Peninsula. The campaign was a masterpiece of Yorktown, and the triumph of Yorktown, 160 years ago on October 19, 1781, was the victory in the field whereby the United States did indeed assume, among the powers of the earth, that separate and equal station prophetically voiced by the Declaration of Independence. The basic strategy of Yorktown turned upon the effective concentration of French and American naval and military commands against a vulnerable sector of the far-flung British area of occupation. The opportunity to attack Cornwallis arose out of a number of interlocking sequences combinations involving naval and military tactics, diplomatic representations, and a jealous personal rivalry within the British High Command. Yet the master strategist was Washington. The success of the campaign, once the American offensive was set in motion, depended upon the speed, secrecy, and precision with which the decisive thrust was marched, launched, and driven home. Here again, Washington's mastery of the art of war places him among the very great captains of military history. Few soldiers in any age have shown finer military abilities than Washington displayed in this crisis of the Revolution. 
You have still kindled the torch of victory from the embers of despair. It must be remembered that as the war went into the spring of 1781, the American armies were near dissolution. A small southern army out of the brilliant Nathaniel Green kept a stalemate watch on the British in Charleston. Lafayette, later to be reinforced by Wayne, dared not seek a decisive engagement with Cornwallis in Virginia. Washington himself, containing the British in New York from his position at West Point, could oppose only some 3,500 Continentals, mostly from New England, to Sir Henry Clinton's 10,000 regulars, supported and supplied by a strong naval force. Moreover, Washington's army was dwindling, not growing. The Continental Congress had exhausted its resources. Colonial militia units were widely scattered, poorly armed, miserably clothed and fed. But for French help, it may be well that the American army could not have kept the field in 1781. The first considerable French reinforcement to come to the aid of the Allied cause was Count Rochambeau's small army of 4,000 men, landed at Newport in July 1780. Rochambeau remained in Newport for a full year, his detachment acting as a guard for a French fleet there blockaded by more powerful British squadron, and forming with Washington's men on the Hudson, a weak potential threat against the British in New York. With this limited force, Washington planned an offensive of opportunity should Clinton weaken the New York garrison by sending troops to Cornwallis in Virginia. Even so, a movement against Clinton in the New York area, an attack by land forces against strongly held British positions on Long, Manhattan, and Staten Island, required at least a temporary command of the water approaches. A small French squadron already shut up in Newport could not be expected to make headway against the far larger British naval command. Washington's main hope, whether against Clinton or Cornwallis, was to secure the major reinforcement available in the large French fleet and army under the command of Count de Grasse, and known to be en route from France to the West Indies. As early as May, Washington was in correspondence with the Luzerne the French minister at Philadelphia, urging that this powerful naval and military armada be brought to the American coast. Washington's diplomacy was successful. Washington's strategy saw the Chesapeake Bay region, the first area of joint operations with New York as a secondary objective. Yet so skillfully were Washington's intentions disguised, as early as June, Clinton thought himself in danger of immediate attack. His first reaction was to order Cornwallis to forward 2,000 men to reinforce New York's idle garrison. The order was later rescinded, yet it was remembered with contempt by officers and men with Cornwallis, who had indeed fought steadily in the South. But in July, the American commander-in-chief brought Rochambeau's army into conjunction with his own at Peekskill on the Hudson. Only a handful of the highest American officers knew of Washington's plan. It remained a top secret, while Washington and Rochambeau awaited news of the de Grasse expedition. De Grasse reported by a dispatch received in August. He would shape his course for Chesapeake Bay, he asked the immediate cooperation of French and American land forces. He warned that he could not remain in American coastal waters after mid-October. This last condition imposed an exacting limitation on Washington's timetable for the campaign. Meanwhile, on August 1st, Cornwallis withdrew from the main Virginia theater and began the leisurely fortification of Yorktown. In March, Cornwallis had won a tactical victory over Green in the bitterly fought action of Guilford Courthouse. Yet his costly success in the field was barren of strategic fruits so long as Green's army remained in being. In July, the sharp skirmish of Green Springs, Virginia, was no more decisive against Lafayette and Wayne. 
The American forces, by avoiding a pitched battle, can cancel any immediate promise of British success in Virginia. That Cornwallis and his withdrawal would put his army in a position from which there could be no retreat but by sea cannot have been anticipated by Washington. In all probability, Cornwallis, entrenched at Yorktown, in full confidence that the British fleet would continue to dominate the American seaboard. The choice of Yorktown was a fatal choice, of course. Yet it was a blunder committed after a long series of confusing and contradictory orders passing down the British change of command. Cornwallis and Clinton had been at loggerheads before and during the final campaign. Clinton's last-minute orders to fortify Old Point Comfort as a naval as well as a military base were utterly impractical, since the anchorage could not be made into a safe harbor for major British vessels. In addition, Cornwallis, the Earl, felt at liberty to disregard the orders of Clinton, a lesser nobleman. He did not cross the Chesapeake. But the choice of Yorktown aside, such was the concentration that Washington brought to bear against Cornwallis, that nothing but a successful naval intervention could save the British Army in Virginia. The grass got his message through to Washington on August 14th. Five days later, the American Northern Army moved out swiftly and secretly with a force of about 4,000 French and 2,000 Americans. Still considering his objective, Washington contrived to make the first stage of the advance to New Jersey seem a sweep against New York from the south. Intelligence that the grass was at sea forced a British naval rendezvous off Sandy Hook. Tittle looked to his defenses and stood to his guns. By great good luck, a British naval reconnaissance into Chesapeake Bay came five days too soon. On August 30th, Washington's troops swerved away from New York and set out by forced marches for Head of Elk, Maryland, from which point they might take transport by water down the Chesapeake. On that day, the British may have divined Washington's intentions. But on August 30th, de Grasse, with 28 ships of the line, six frigates, 19,000 seamen, and 3,000 French regulars stood in the Chesapeake Bay. The French land force of the ample artillery would hurry to shore. I cannot in the time at my disposal dwell upon the details of the sea and land fighting which sealed the fate of Cornwallis in the British dream of American empire. Lafayette, Wayne, and the newly arrived French army promptly blocked the British avenue of escape by land. Cornwallis' last hope went glimmering when British naval intervention failed in the fleet action of September 5th, 19 British ships of the line against 25 Frenchmen, and the British attack so bungled as to throw away the initial advantage of surprise and maneuver. Lafayette very generously and very prudently waited until Washington's main army could come into conjunction with his own. French and American forces together outnumber the defenders of Yorktown two to one. By September 28th, the doomed garrison was confined within its inner defense perimeter. On October 9th, Allied siege cannon opened on the British works, Washington himself firing the first American gun. Since the Americans were unfamiliar with siege operations, the slow ritual of cannonade and advance by parallels was directed by European professionals. The investment was more deliberate than deadly. Losses on both sides were surprisingly small. On October 14th, a storming column selected from Lafayette's light infantry, led by Alexander Hamilton and composed chiefly of Connecticut men, carried one vital British redoubt, while a French column of 400 grenadiers and chasseurs stormed a second. The British Carter attack of October 15th was easily beaten off. On October 17th, the British drums beat a parley. On the 19th, as the world knows, Cornwallis surrendered. The pageantry of the surrender with the French allies and British troops of the Royal Guards Brigade, gorgeously arrayed, has long been remembered. 
Yet to an American, the most moving spectacle at Yorktown centered not upon European uniform, but rather upon the three divisions of some 5,000 American continentals, the veterans of a score of desperate fields. On the extreme right in the post of honor, under Lafayette, were the select troops of the 1st Division, the celebrated Corps of Light Infantry, most of them New Englanders. Von Steuben's 2nd Division included the immortal regiments of the Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Virginia line. General Lincoln commanded the 3rd Division, made up of New York, New Jersey, and Rhode Island men. There was little of military pageantry about the war-worn Continentals. There was less about the ragged and all but naked Virginia militiamen, 3,000 of them under command of their governor. But the militiamen, too, had distinguished themselves in the campaign, earning the special thanks of their commander-in-chief. The scene which lives in American history is the slow British advance between the armies of the victorious allies. The British fifes playing, the world turned upside down. Cornwallis himself, mentally and physically distressed, did not take part in the ceremony. He sent his sword by General O'Hara, his second in command. O'Hara offered the symbol of surrender to Rochambeau, who gestured toward Washington, who in turn nodded toward General Lincoln. Lincoln formally received the sword and graciously returned it to the defeated officer. The surrender was completed by the presentation of flags and laying down of arms. I think it should be added that Cornwallis, surviving his defeat to serve a diminishing empire in Ireland and in India, no honors for Yorktown appear on the battle standards of the British Guard. The sober verdict of history was little to do with the incidental pomp and circumstances attendant upon the drama of Yorktown. The battle fought 168 years ago last Wednesday gave forever into American hands the destinies of a new nation conceived in liberty. The service of the French naval and military officers deserve full praise, and it must not be forgotten that Washington was in supreme command. The campaign of Yorktown was Washington's own. To save the offensive in the face of superior forces, to mystify the enemy, and to effect a brilliant concentration at precisely the right time. These are the achievements of superb generalship. The triumph of Yorktown was thus Washington's triumph in the field. It remains an authentic masterpiece in the art of war. Colonel Robert R. McCormick, editor and publisher of the Chicago Tribune, has been heard in another of his featured weekly radio commentaries delivered from the stage of the Chicago Theater of the Air. Free copies of tonight's address on the triumph at Yorktown may be obtained by writing to the Mutual Broadcasting System, Chicago 11, Illinois. The Chicago Theater of the Air continues tonight's production of The Mikado by Gilbert and Sullivan, starring Norma Lotze, David Polari, and John Barkley, conducted by Henry Weber... Narrated by Marion Clare. In the boudoir of the lovely Yum Yum are underway for her marriage to Nanki Poo, an unfortunate lad who is to be beheaded in one month's time by orders of Coco, Lord High Executioner. Yum Yum's ladies-in-waiting, Pity Singh and Peep Bo, are busily engaged in braiding Yum Yum's raven hair.
little more rouge on Yum Yum's cheek, did he sing? Oh, yes, Peepo. And loosen Yum Yum's braid on the right side ever so little. Thank you, Pity Sing. Thank you, Peepo. Mm -hmm. Oh, Yum Yum, you are so beautiful. More beautiful than anyone else anywhere. Yes, Pity Sing, I know. Sometimes I sit and wonder in my artless Japanese way why I am so attractive. Can this be vanity? Oh, but no, nature is lovely too and rejoices in her loveliness. I am a child of nature and take after my mother. The sun whose rays are all ablaze with ever living glory does not deny his majesty. I love best, and I believe I'm the happiest girl in Japan. If only your husband weren't to be beheaded in a month, your happiness could be complete. Yes, that does take the top off of things, doesn't it? Oh, why do you remind me? Can't you let me forget it? <laughs> What's this? Yum Yum in tears on her wedding day? Oh, Nanky Poo, they've been reminding me that in a month you're to be beheaded. <laughs> yes. You are to be beheaded. You are to be beheaded, you know. Hmm. This sort of thing is depressing. Uh, come, come, don't let's be downhearted. No, no, let's be perfectly happy. <laughs> let's, let's thoroughly enjoy ourselves. Are you enjoying yourself, Tish Tush? Certainly. <laughs> it's absurd to cry. <laughs> Quite ridiculous. <laughs> Brightly dawns our wedding day. Joy and shall we give thee greeting. With a weather of all pleasing. Take a moment, pretty stay. Take a moment, pretty stay. Yum, yum, my poor child. Oh, Coco. What is the nature of your distress, Coco? I have quite inadvertently ascertained that by the Mikado's law, when a married man is beheaded, his wife is buried alive with him. Be 
buried alive. alive. I'm buried alive, a most unpleasant death. Uh, Nanky Poo, I love you with all my heart, and I shall never love anyone half so much, but, my darling, when I agreed to marry you, uh, marry you, that is, I had no idea that a... I mean, it, it does make a difference. A difference, that is. Uh, yes, it does make a difference. Buried alive. A beastly death, especially for a woman. Oh, dear, what a dreadful plight. Yes, isn't it? It is indeed. <laughs> Here's how they do if I marry you. When you're going to come to Paris, then the maiden whom you cherish must be slaughtered too. Here's the how they do. Here's the how they do. Here's a pretty mess in a month or less. I must die without a wedding. Let the bitter tears I'm shedding witness my distress. Here's a pretty mess. Here's a pretty mess. Here's a state of things. To her life she clings. Matrimonial devotion doesn't seem to suit her notion. Burial it brings. Here's a state of things. Here's a state of things. With a passion that's intense, I worship and adore. But the love of common sense we ought to ignore. If what I say is true. Just to marry you. Here's a pretty state of things. Here's a pretty how do do. Here's a pretty state of things. A pretty state of things. Here's a how do. Here's a how do. Here's a how do. Here's a how do. For if what I say is true, I cannot, cannot marry you. Here's a pretty, pretty state of things. Here's a pretty how do do. Coco. Coco, Your Excellency. Eh? Hey, what is it, Puba? The Mikado and his suite approach the town. The Mikado? He's coming to see whether his orders have been carried out. Look here, Nagy Poo, this is getting serious. Someone simply must be executed. Very well, then. Behead me. But what? Now? Certainly. At once. Chop it off. Chop it off. Oh, my good sir, this cannot be done at a moment's notice. I've had no practice. I'd have to start with a, a, a guinea pig and work my way up to a second trombone. What of it? We all have had unpleasant duties to perform at times. Wait. Huh? Why should I execute you when making an affidavit that you've been executed will do just as well? Pooh bars plenty of witnesses. What? Am I to understand that all the high officers of state, which are me, are to perjure ourselves for your safety? Why not? You'll be grossly insulted as usual. Will the insult be cashed down or at a date? A ready money transaction. Very well. Choose your fiction and I'll endorse ah. it. Away with you, Nanky Poo. You've been officially beheaded. Be gone. But what of Yum Yum? Oh, bother Yum Yum. I have troubles enough. Take her and be gone. Marry her and never darken Titty Poo again. The son of heaven. His Royal Highness, the Mikado of Japan. Miyasama, Miyasama, onama no mayami, pira pira sura no anajana. Toko tonyare, tonyare na. Your Majesty, I'm honored to welcome you. The execution has taken place as you wish. Oh, you've had an execution, have you? Uh, quite so. The coroner has just handed me this certificate. Very interesting. But I have come about an entirely different matter. Uh, a different matter? Coco, this is Madame Catishaw. Oh, how do you do? My good man, the son of our gracious Mikado disappeared from court a year ago. He was to have married me. Indeed, a worthy explanation of his disappearance. Oh! My good man, perhaps my face is plain, but I have a left shoulder blade that is a miracle of loveliness. And my right elbow has a fascination that none can resist. So, allow me. Oh, no, no, no. It is on view Tuesdays and Fridays only on presentation of a visiting card. As for my circulation, it is the largest in the world. And still he fled. Yes. And now I understand that he is masquerading in your town of Titipu, disguised as a second trombone. <gasps> your Majesty, look! Uh, what is it, madam? The name on this death certificate. Nanky Poo, beheaded this morning. Oh, where shall I find the 
Father. Mercy, Your Majesty. Mercy. Yes, by all means, mercy, Your Majesty. Oh, dear, 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 dear. This is very tiresome. My poor fellow, in your anxiety to carry out my wishes, you have beheaded the heir to the throne of Japan. Get ashore, my dear. I quite forget. What is the punishment for compassing the death of the heir apparent? Something lingering, Your Majesty, with boiling oil in it, I can't say. Oh, mercy, mercy. I can't quite remember whether it was boiling oil or melted lead. Oh, mercy, mercy. mercy. A more humane Mikado never did in Japan exist. To nobody second, I'm certainly reckoned a true philanthropist. It is my very humane endeavor to make to some extent each evil liver a running river of harmless merriment. My object of sublime, I shall achieve in time to let the punishment fit the crime, the punishment fit the crime, and make each prisoner pent, unwillingly represent a source of innocent merriment, of innocent merriment. All prosy, dull society sinners who'd clatter and beat and bore are sent to hear sermons from mystical Germans who preach from ten till four. The amateur tenor whose vocal villainies all desire to shirk shall during off hours exhibit his powers to Madame Tussauds waxwork. The lady who dyes a chemical yellow or stains her gray hair puce or pinches her middle as black like a griddle with permanent walnut juice. The idiot who in railway carriages scribbles on window panes. We only suffer to ride on a buffer in parliamentary trains. <laughs> His object of sublime, he will achieve in time to let the punishment be the crime, the punishment be the crime, and make his prisoner fair, unwillingly represent a source of innocent fair and then of innocent fair in Well, I must say, Coco, you've gotten us into a fine bath of oil. Or is it hot lead? Ooh, horrible picture, Pooba. Fortunately, Nanky Poo hasn't left town yet. Nanky Poo, Nanky Poo. Yes? Nanky Poo, I have the best of news for you. You're reprieved. Oh, but it's too late for that. I'm a dead man and I'm off for my honeymoon. Nonsense. A terrible thing has just happened. It seems that you're the son of the Mikado. Yes, but that happened some time ago. Nanky Poo, you're the son of the Mikado. How wonderful. Now I'm his daughter-in-law. Is this a time for airy persiflage? Alas, your father is here with Katisha and has condemned me along with Puba. Yes, and all of my royal personages. There's only one chance for you, Coco. If you persuade Katisha to marry you, she will have no further claim on me and I would not be aloof to coming back to life. Katisha, my good man, have you seen her? She's something appalling. Appalling or not, it comes to this. While Catashaw's single eye shall remain a disembodied spirit, when Catashaw is married, existence on earth will be as welcome as the flowers in the spring. The flowers that spring bloom in the spring, Trolla, we promise of merry sunshine. As we merrily dance and we sing, Trolla, we welcome the hope that they bring, Trolla, of a summer of roses and wine, of a summer of roses and wine. And that's what we mean when we say that a thing is welcome as flowers that bloom in the spring. Tra la 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 ha, tra la 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 ha, the flowers that bloom in the spring. Tra la 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 ha, la 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 The flowers that bloom in the spring, Trada, has nothing to do with the case. I've got to take under my wing, Trada, a most unattractive old thing, Trada, with a caricature of a face, with a caricature of a face. And that's what I mean when I say or I see, oh, father, the flowers that bloom in the spring. Tra la 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 la, tra la 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 la, oh, father, the flowers of spring. Tra la 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 la, tra la 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 la. Katisha, kitty, 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 a moment, please. So, 
the miscreant who robbed me of my love. But vengeance pursues. They are hitting the cauldron. Katisha, behold, a suppliant at thy feet. Katisha, mercy. Mercy? Had you mercy when you slew my love? I swear he would have loved me in time. I am an acquired taste. Only the educated palate can appreciate me. I was educating his palate when he left me. He is dead, and where shall I find another? It takes years to train a man to love me. Am I to implore mercy for you who robbed me of my prey? I mean, pupil? Just as his education was on the point of completion? Oh, where shall I find another? Here, Katisha. Here. What? Katisha, for years I have loved you with a white hot passion that is slowly but surely consuming my very vitals. I dare not hope for your love, but I will not live without it. Bosh! Who knows so well as I that no one ever dies of a broken heart? My dear, you know not what you say. Listen to the tale of one whose heart was indeed broken. Who? Of whom are you speaking? On a tree by a river, a little taunted, sang Willow, tit Willow, tit Willow. And I said to him, Dicky Bird, why do you sit singing Willow, tit Willow, tit Willow? He sobbed and he sighed, and a girdle he gave, then he plunged himself into the billowy wave. And an echo rose from the suicide's grave. Oh, Willow, tit Willow, tit Willow. Now I feel just as sure as I'm sure that my name isn't Willow, tit Willow, tit Willow. That was blighted affection that made him exclaim, Oh, Willow, tit Willow. It will and if you remain callous and obdurate, I shall perish as he did, and you will know why, though I probably shall not exclaim as I die. Oh, Willow, did you willow? Did you willow? Oh dear, oh dear, such a sad tale. Did little Tit Willow really die of love? Most assuredly. I knew the bird intimately. Oh, poor little chap. And and if I refuse you, will you go and do the same? At once. No, 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 you mustn't. Anything but that. Well, 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 my good Coco, is everything arranged? Is she going to marry you? Pooba, I am going to marry him indeed, to save him from the fate of little Tit Willow. Pooba, greater love hath no man. Now then, Pistache, have all the painful preparations been made? Your Majesty, all is prepared. Good, then produce the two unfortunate gentlemen. Your Majesty! What's this? Catishaw? Mercy, Your Majesty! Mercy for Coco! Mercy even for Poobah. For who? Uh, she said mercy for me, Your Majesty. Uh, Poobah, Lord High Everything else. Mercy! I have married this miserable object, Coco, before the official registrar. I am the registrar. So, but my difficulty is that these gentlemen have slain the heir apparent. The heir apparent is not dead. Huh? Flesh my heart, my son. And your daughter-in-law elected. Traitor! Coco, you traitor! You have deceived me! Unhand me! Unhand me! It's all very simple, Your Majesty. Merely corroborative detail intended to give artistic verisimilitude to a ball. Enough, and... enough, Kuba. Your Majesty, I will explain. Proceed, Coco, proceed. It's like this. When Your Majesty says, let a thing be done, that thing's as good as done. Practically, it is done, because Your Majesty's will is law. Your Majesty says, kill a gentleman, and a gentleman is told off to be killed. Consequently, that gentleman is as good as dead. Practically, he is dead. And if he is dead, why not say so? I see. Nothing could possibly be more satisfactory. Or, I might add, completely confusing. The threatened cloud has passed away. But though the night may come too soon. Then let the throng with the song. Let the throng 
Speaking roles tonight, Muriel Bremner as Yum Yum, Everett Clark as Nanky Poo, Carl Cronkey as Pooh Bah, Hope Summers as Cathy Shaw, Norman Gottschalk as Pish Tush, Maurice Copeland as the Mikado, Titty Singh and Pete Bowe were Sandra Gare and Elmira Ressler. This is Lee Bennett inviting you to next week's Chicago Theater of the Air feature production, The Pink Lady, starring Virginia Haskins and David Polary, and conducted by Henry Weber. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.